Good morning and welcome into this time of worship once more. We have lit the candles reminding us of God's presence with us in this place. And I invite you to make your worship space special as well, perhaps by lighting a candle, but by setting apart a place where uh, this is a time of renewal. This is a time uh, to be special and set apart. Uh, and so we gather wherever we are for this time of worship, knowing that God is present with us. I invite you here as a part of First Congregational Church of Willimantic, and I remind you that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Let us gather together as the community of faith. And I invite you to center your hearts and minds in God's presence as we listen to the music of the prelude. And now, as we gather, I welcome you with these words. Come, share the joy of the Lord, delight in God's goodness. Praise God who gives each person a special gift to be nurtured and shared. Lord, we thank you for these gifts. Come, let us worship God who entrusts us with so much. Lord, make us worthy of your love and trust in us. Amen. And now I invite you into a time of prayer. Let us pray. 
Gracious and generous God, you are always with us, offering guidance, healing, and hope. We know that when things seem dark or are dazzlingly bright, when troubled times assail or peace reigns, there you are with us. Continue to guide and challenge our lives. Lead us in pathways of service and away from trails of fear and anxiety. Open our hearts to receive your healing, transforming love, that we might serve you more faithfully. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And I read from Scripture today from Matthew's Gospel. It uh, begins at the end of chapter 9 with verse 35 and then continues uh, into chapter 10 for the first 23 verses. We hear about the ministry of Jesus and then him sending out the disciples as well on his behalf. Hear the word of God. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into God's harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother, Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You re received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, Find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will be betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, 
and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is the word of God for you, God's children. Amen. In a sense, as we gather today, uh, I invite you now to hear the song as John plays it uh, with the band, Heaven So Small. Let us continue to reflect on the scripture as we hear this song, Heaven So Small. Excuse me, sir, what did you say? When you shout so loud, it's hard to tell. You say that I must change my ways, for I am surely bound for hell. Well, I know you dare me if you could, but my friend, that's simply not your call. If God is great and God is good. Why is your heaven so small? You say you know, you say you've read that holy Bible on the Yourself. For I know you damn me if you could, my friend, that's simply not your call. If God is great and God is good, why is your heaven so small? That shake and eyes that burn What makes you do these things you do I would not be surprised to learn Someone somewhere excluded you My friend, imagine if you a love much mightier than us all. If God is great and God is good, why is your heaven so small? As we gather today and listen to the scripture and hear the sermon, in some respects, it's a continuation of last week's sermon. It's kind of a, a new page or a second part of that one. Uh, last week, we were challenged to understand that God's grace is offered to all and that we are called uh, to journey beyond our comfort zone, beyond our own people, and offer God's grace even to those who seem to have opposed us previously, even to those that we may not personally like. Uh, and as I reflect on that, I remember the words that we offer uh, at the beginning of each service, that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And I believe those words. I believe that, and I seek to live that out. But I think it's much harder to put into practice than to just speak those words. Uh, to hear those, to say those words is one thing. Uh, to then live them out, to go to those other people, to welcome all into God's presence is much more difficult and much more challenging. 
Uh, and so as we hear this scripture today, we're reminded that we are to be as wise as serpents, but as innocent as doves, because it is not easy. All are welcome, but not anything goes. And to find that difference is challenging, and to hold standards is challenging. I'm reminded of a problem that one of my colleagues had. There was a former Connecticut uh, United Church of Christ minister who was convicted of child sexual abuse. Uh, he took advantage of his position in with, within the church. And after his conviction, uh, when he uh, returned back out into the community, re-entered society, uh, he settled in a town and still here within Connecticut, and he joined a local church. And as he was a member of that church and uh, started to support it and started to become active in it, he asked for keys to the church so that he could practice some music on his own and come in uh, at, an at another time uh, when nobody else was around. But that was just a bridge too far. That was not going to happen. And it became a difficult situation, or uh, at least one that the pastor had to recon reconcile for themselves, uh, recon uh, re um, welcoming this person back in, welcoming them as a member, but knowing there had to be limits there because of his past. Uh, for the safety of the congregation, they just couldn't hand him the keys that he could come in at any time and uh, use the church. And so uh, for the good of the community, uh, even though he was welcome there, uh, there were limits that were to be placed on that. And I think that is the challenge for us as we continue to live out this practice of going to those uh, that we may have been on the other side that we didn't formally like, of welcoming uh, all into our congregation, uh, that it is uh, our challenge then to also now how to keep those safe that are part of our community. I'm reminded of Rabbi Edwin Friedman, who was a psychologist and author, uh, he was known for his family systems theory, particularly as it related uh, to congregations and leadership within congregations. Uh, and he had a book that he published, Generation to Generation, uh, that was um, used widely among congregations and its leaders and continues to be used widely. He also had a little book of parables called Friedman's Fables, and I'm going to read one of those to you now. It's called uh, The Friendly Forest. The Friendly Forest. Once upon a time in the friendly forest, there lived a lamb who loved to graze and frolic about. One day, a tiger came to the forest and said to the animals, I would like to live among you. They were delighted, for unlike some of the other forests, they had no tiger in their woods. The lamb, however, had some apprehensions, which, being a lamb, she sheepishly expressed to her friends. But, said they, do not worry, we will talk to the tiger and explain that one of the conditions for living in this forest is that you must also let the other animals live in the forest. So the lamb went about her life as usual, but it was not long before the tiger began to growl and make threatening gestures and menacing motions. Each time the frightened lamb went to her friends and said, it is very uncomfortable for me here in the forest. But her friends reassured her, do not worry, that's just the way tigers behave. Every day as she went about her life, the lamb tried to remember this advice, hoping the tiger would find somebody else to growl at. And it is probably correct to say that the tiger did not really spend all or even most of its time stalking the lamb. Still, the lamb found it increasingly difficult to remove the tiger from her thoughts. Sometimes she would just catch it out of the corner of her eye, 
but that would seem enough to disconcert her for the day, even if the cat were asleep. Soon the lamb found that she was actually looking for the tiger. Sometimes days or even weeks went by between its intrusive actions. Yet somehow the tiger had succeeded in always being there. Eventually the tiger's existence became a part of the lamb's existence. When she tried to explain this to her friends, however, they pointed out that no harm had really befallen her and that perhaps she was just being too sensitive. So the lamb again tried to put the tiger out of her mind. Why, she said to herself, should I let my relationship with just one member of the forest ruin my relationships with all the others? But every now and then, usually when she was least prepared, the tiger would give her another start. Finally, the lamb could not take it anymore. She decided that much as she loved the forest and her friends, more than she had ever loved any other forest or friends, the cost was too great. She went to the other animals in the woods and said goodbye. Her friends would not hear of it. This is silly, they said. Nothing has happened. You're still in one piece. You must remember that a tiger is a tiger. Surely this is the nicest forest in the world. We really like you very much. We would be very sad if you left. Though it must be admitted that several of the animals were wondering what the lamb might be doing to contribute to the tiger's aggressiveness. Then, said two of the animals in the friendly forest, surely this whole thing can be worked out. We're all reasonable here. Stay calm. There is probably just some misunderstanding that can easily be resolved if we all sit down together and communicate. The lamb, however, had several misgivings about such a meeting. First of all, if her friends had explained away the tiger's behavior by saying it was simply a tiger's nature to behave that way, why did they now think that as a result of communication, the tiger would be able to change that nature. Second thought, the lamb, such meetings, well-intentioned as they might be, usually try to resolve problems through compromise. Now, while the tiger might agree to growl less, and indeed might succeed in reducing some of its aggressive behavior, what would she, the lamb, be expected to give up in return? be more accepting of the tiger's growling? There was something wrong, thought the lamb, with the notion that an agreement is equal if the invasive creature agrees to be less invasive and the invaded one agrees to tolerate some invasiveness. She tried to explain this to her friends, but being reasonable animals, they assured her that the important thing was to keep communicating. Perhaps the tiger didn't understand the ways of a lamb. Don't be so sheepish, they said. Speak up strongly when it does these things. Though one of the less subtle animals in the forest, more uncouth in expression and unconcerned about just who remained, was overheard to remark, I never heard of anything so ridiculous. If you want a lamb and a tiger to live in the same forest, you don't try to make them communicate. You cage the bloody tiger. And so it is, the challenge within our own community, within our own faith. How can we be welcoming to all while not tolerating all behaviors, while keeping it a safe community for those that attend there? So while we may reach out to those who are uh, on the other side, if you will, beyond our normal comfort, uh, there's some things that have to change. Uh, as we saw it last week in that story about Jonah, that the people of Nineveh had to repent in order to find God's mercy. Uh, they couldn't keep on with their ways. And so within our own outreach, it still remains 
uh, that while we are open to all, that we are also a community and we care for our members in ways that need to be safe. And so while we are open to all, there are standards of behavior that we expect within our congregation as well. So we are open to all, as we say, but with white supremacists, uh, that behavior is intolerable within our community. Uh, it is threatening to some of our members. Uh, and so we, we say, speak the words, all are welcome here, but then putting them into practice becomes much more difficult. And when somebody new comes along that may threaten uh, in some way with their behavior, we have to understand uh, that, uh, like the friendly forest, that there may come a point where we have to cage the bloody tiger in order to keep it safe. Uh, the same for those that may be homophobic in an opening and affirming congregation. Um, it's not acceptable to have members coming in. They may have a hard time at first uh, being open and firming, and we can let them grow. Uh, but if they're actively working to take away job security for members of the LGBTQ community, or if they're trying to rescind marriage equality, uh, that those are behaviors that just aren't acceptable. So this welcome is easy to speak, but more difficult to put into practice. It really does challenge us. Uh, challenge us. Uh, and so as we hear Jesus sending out his disciples, uh, sending them into all communities, he's a realist about it. Some will be able to follow your words. Some will hear and accept and others not. And you just have to be comfortable with that. Uh, and he challenges them and he challenges us to be as innocent as doves, but as wise as serpents. That is the challenge of our faith that we hear this morning. Amen. And now let us hear the great proclamation about God in the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. And I invite you to sing along at home, uh, but to enjoy this uh, standard and familiar hymn uh, that is so dear to our hearts. Holy, Holy, Holy.
And now I invite you to be in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you do send us out as disciples of Christ into the world to proclaim the good news of your kingdom, to proclaim the good news of your abiding presence with us, to proclaim the good news of your grace that brings forgiveness and reconciliation. Send us out courageously, but send us out wisely as well, that we can offer open hearts, open minds, and open arms to those that would be a part of our community. But help us also to maintain a community of safety and wholeness for our members, where we may be gathered together and know that we are treasured as God's children. May we continue to look at our own lives, to examine them, confess our own faults, and to reshape our lives by the vision and standards of the gospel that Christ has entrusted to us so that we are continually growing in our faith. And as people of faith, may we be those who are welcoming others in, allowing them to experience the great love of God in Jesus Christ. Help us to continue to extend that welcome, even in these difficult times as we come through another surge and find ourselves having to stay home and stay safe. May we reach out to those in their own homes who are also trying to stay safe. Continue to guide us into this future. Continue to sharpen our minds to be effective in our ministries and continue to open our hearts to your love and to others. We pray for those who are struggling with health, especially as the virus increases in our community. May those who contract the virus find mild cases May they find the therapies that are necessary for healing. And we pray for those who are developing a preventative shot for this virus. We pray for those who mourn in these difficult times, who are separated from loved ones and cannot gather as they would like. May you hold their hearts. May you bring them comfort. We pray for our community. May we find ways to meet one another's needs, to be connected in sustaining ways, even as we stay separate or removed for health and safety's ways. Guide us forward with your wisdom, we pray, O oh God. And now we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as we remember our offerings, our gifts that we offer this congregation as we seek to sustain the ministries of Christ in our community, we are also in the midst of our stewardship campaign. And I invite you, as you consider this week's gifts, to consider your intentions for the coming year. Uh, we share one more video with you as we've uh, remembered the three great loves that we seek to share, love of neighbor, love of creation, and today especially love of children. So I share this video with you. Uh, next week we will be making our commitments as we receive our pledge cards 
Uh, we will be making our commitments to the coming year uh, to sustain the needs of our congregation and our work in the community. So let us uh, remember our faithfulness as we think about our love for children practiced through our denomination widely, but specifically through First Congregational Church of Willimantic. Greetings, church family. My name is Reverend Tracy Blackman, and I am delighted to serve as your Associate General Minister of Justice and Local Church Ministries. When we're not in the midst of a pandemic, it is also my privilege to travel the breadth of our denomination nationally and to spend time with you in your churches. To worship with you, to commune with you, to get to know you better is indeed one of the highlights of this call. When Andrew Warner, our generosity officer, asked that I speak for a few moments about love of children, it was not a difficult task. I have so many stories I could tell of how I've seen love of children lived out in our local congregations, but he only gave me three minutes. So I'm going to live two examples for you that I'm sure reverberate throughout our denomination. I happened to be at Plymouth UCC in Des Moines, Iowa, the Sunday they celebrated four-year-olds completing their classes to prepare them for big school. What a joy it is to witness discipleship in the church, the teaching of children, of what it means to be followers of Jesus. On this Sunday, those four-year-olds had the opportunity to come to the pulpit area and be celebrated by the entire church. They received Bibles and were able to express their gratitude to their parents and to their siblings. And then they were escorted to the middle aisle of the church where the entire congregation laid hands upon them and prayed for their school year and prayed for their strong witness of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in big school. In Boston at Old South Church, I had the opportunity to preach both services and the first service is held in the alcove of the church, a small intimate area for a smaller group of congregants. After the sermon, communion happens. And before communion, a bell rang and the door sprang open and children began to flood into the room, waving their fingers at the communion table, participating in the blessing of the elements. How does this show love for children? It reminds us that there is no age discrimination in God, that we are all equally valuable and equally important in the kingdom. The children participating in communion reminds us of this. The United Church of Christ expresses love for children in so many ways, including even at General Synod, inviting children to have reflections and participation in our resolution process has certainly served to strengthen our commitment to the leadership of the next generation. Our children are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today, and they are the leaders of our next. How we invest in them speaks of what we think about God and what we think about the kingdom here on earth. I am deeply honored to be on this journey with all of you and to watch all the expressions of the way that we love children. Thank you for your generosity, your generosity financially, your generosity spiritually, your generosity intellectually, your generosity of presence. May God bless you in all that you do. And may we continue to love our children together.
And as faithful people, we have gathered remotely, but still connected. As faithful people, we go to be the people of God, as innocent as doves, but as wise as serpents. As you go, may it be the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship and unity of the Holy Spirit that's with you now and always. Go in peace. Amen.